Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Good to have you with us. And we are starting a new study in the book of Daniel. Although the first passage you're going to be looking at starts in Acts 17. Then we'll get back to Daniel. And uh, God is telling us that uh, against the backdrop of world empires, his agenda and plan for the ages. And men seek to build empires, but God seeks to build faithful men for a future empire in eternity. And if an empire is not God-honoring or serving his purposes, and remember, his purposes are not our purposes, and uh, his ways past finding out, uh, he can replace it. And uh, so Paul said well in Acts chapter 17, these words, starting with verse 24, The God who made the world and all things in it. Now, he was at the uh, Mars Hill, which was dedicated to um, listening and finding out new things. And there was a statue nearby, and it said, To an unknown God. And uh, he, therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. The God I'm going to tell you about is bigger than anything you can imagine. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. The God that I am going to tell you about doesn't need a thing from us. As a matter of fact, he gives us everything. He himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. Started with Adam made Eve out of Adam, and made the entire world from those two people. And uh, actually going all the way back to Adam, just the one man, the first man that he created directly. And uh, as a result, uh, he has populated this whole earth, and he is your creator, and you better have some notion of him and seek him. And it says here, uh, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. So he's the one who determines how long you live. He determines where you, uh, how long you live and where you live and the, the government that you have and what you do with your life, that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men, that all people everywhere should repent, change their mind, know who he is. Don't make themselves a God. Make God God, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. You're going to have a day of judgment. And this judgment is going to be through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. That's Jesus Christ, my friends. And so there's going to come a day of judgment, and this righteous God, who's the creator of us all, who determines our habitation, our length of life, our government, raises up and brings down, this God is going to give us a day of judgment, and it's going to be done by Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's best that you know him, and you get things settled out. So, even Israel, even Israel, when not honoring him, can be temporarily set aside. I say temporarily because God has made forever promises to them, and he's going to keep his promises. 
maybe not to that particular group of Israelites because of their unfaithfulness, but to the nation of Israel and the faithful ones inside of it. And it is going to be all that way to eternity. And it's very important for us to understand that he will keep his promises to Israel. Because if he isn't going to keep his promises to Israel, what hope do we have? He'll keep promises to us. So everybody has a vested interest in realizing that God will keep his promises. But he has said in Deuteronomy 28, verses 63 through 68, that if you do not keep your, your part of the bargain to me, I will send famines, I will have pestilence, uh, there will be plagues, you will be overrun by your enemies, and lastly, if need be, I will deport you, and I will move you out of the land. And then he brings them back into the land and starts over, so to speak. And the nation of Israel is one of the few nations that's uh, left and come back, and left and come back, and now they've come back again, you see. So uh, it's amazing, the tenacity of that it just has the hand of God upon them. Uh, so even Israel, when they are not honoring him, he will temporarily set them aside. And he did it in two stages. Uh, God used the deportation of the northern kingdom. In 722, the, the northern ten tribes called Israel, and uh, he deported them uh, by the Assyrian Empire, which, think Nineveh. And uh, Nineveh, the Assyrian Empire's capital is Nineveh. And they came and deported Israel in 722 B.C. And God had them deported, although he had warned them many, many times not to do this. But they went into idolatry very, very deeply. So he deported them. This was a warning to uh, Judah, which was the southern two tribes. And uh, they didn't pay attention, they didn't heed, and so in 605 B.C., God started deporting them, the first deportation. The second deportation was in 597, and finally the third deportation, where the temple was destroyed and the Jerusalem was ransacked and the walls were broken down. Uh, there were no walls around Jerusalem anymore in 586 B.C. So during this time of spanking, so to speak, God uses Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Daniel to call people to himself. So uh, there was a promise that was made to Israel by, Jer by Jeremiah. And that promise was that after 70 years, I'll bring you back into the land. You can find this promise in Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 4. But it is also reiterated by Daniel. And Daniel was uh, in Babylon over 70 years. And it was getting to that time of the 70th year. And he was wondering, as he was reading this in uh, um, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 2, when this was going to take place. It was going to be about now. Well, I'll start in verse 1 of Daniel 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of years which were revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So he started praying about this and asking God to help him understand how he was going to unfold this and reveal this to him. And uh, so he realized that Israel was going to be brought back to the land. Praise the Lord. And they were. Now, in the book of Daniel, uh, God gives a, an outline of 
succeeding Gentile powers that will basically dominate Israel and that known area of the time. And he does, does this by giving to Nebuchadnezzar a very complex dream of a great statue with a statue with a head of gold and then the silver shoulders and arms, bronze, bowel area and stomach and loins, and then iron legs all the way down to the toes mixed with uh, clay and iron. And uh, we will get into that and all that that means. But at the very end, there's this supernatural little stone carved out of a mountain without hands, and it comes and hits that statue in the feet, and the whole statue disintegrates, and the wind comes and just blows it away like chaff, and this little stone becomes a great mountain and fills the entire earth, and an eternal kingdom is set up. And uh, so... Uh, we see in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44 these words. Chapter 2 and verse 44. In the days of those kings, the toes, the ten toes, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all those kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of a mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is is trustworthy. So this statue dream that is given to Nebuchadnezzar and then interpreted by Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar tells of the great kingdoms that will come and be replaced and be replaced and be replaced and finally the forever kingdom will come and this stone, this supernatural stone representing the Lord Jesus Christ will in fact come and replace all of those kingdoms and be a forever kingdom. And God will raise up and he will bring down. So meanwhile, we see individual people seeking God and the politics are going on and all kinds of things are happening. And Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego are seeking God and living for God individually and there is a kind of a ripsaw situation where they are trying to obey God and also live in the world with these dominating powers and, and people that are playing politics and as unreasonable as they can be. And sometimes their life is on the line. But these people, they uh, live for God. Uh, they are, these men are used as witnesses to Nebuchadnezzar. God loves every man. God wants every man to come to a knowledge of himself and be saved. Nebuchadnezzar is one of them. And these men were being used to witness to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was having a very difficult time realizing who God is, the God of heaven. And finally, although he was warned about this, uh, he was on top of the great Babylon hanging gardens. He looked around and he says, oh, aren't I something? Look at what I have done. This is extraordinary for my glory. And Daniel had warned him, don't get the big head. Of course, it was very hard for him not to. And he got the big head. And God brought him down. And for seven seasons, could have been up to seven years, he ate grass like, a, like an ox and was like a wild animal. And he was out of his mind. And it says that he came back to his mind 
and finally realized who God was. And in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 33, we, uh, we read these words. Immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled, and he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like uh, eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Big long fingernails never, tra never trimmed. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lived forever. Finally, Nebuchadnezzar got it. That supernatural stone that's going to be cut out of a mountain without hands is going to come and be the eternal kingdom. And he is the God of heaven who you have been ignoring. And now I've got your attention. And it says here, these are his own words, Nebuchadnezzar, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. That little stone is going to be supernaturally great and fill the whole earth. And his kingdom endures from generation to generation. I'm nothing in his view. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. But he does according to his will in the hosts of heaven, including make me eating grass for seven years like an ox and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand. I ignored it, and look what happened to me. Or say to him, what have you done? At that time my reason returned to me, and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom, and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out, so I was reestablished in my sovereignty, and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the King of Heaven, for all his works are true and his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. But of course, that was only then. God can't do that now. Oh, yes, he can. And he raises up, and he brings dawn, down. And sometimes we wonder, what in the world is he in power for? Why, he's, he doesn't know what he's doing. And once again, his ways are not our ways, and his ways past finding out. And he puts qualified and unqualified in positions of power. And in the meantime, stresses and strains are upon individual people. And they, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, turn their eyes to God. And they see who is really in charge. And they bow to the God of heaven. And they make their peace. You think something like that could be going on now? You think that maybe God is working with uh, who's going to be president of the United States? You think that there aren't stresses and strains upon you because of who's in power and all the changes and who gets to marry who and all that sort of stuff and what sex you are and all that interference and the plans of God's program. And you think the stresses and strains don't affect us? Think again. And so even though they're trying to build some empire, and maybe it was fair and maybe it wasn't fair. We have to make our individual peace with our God. And we have to stand for what we believe. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, my friends, uh, Nebuchadnezzar came to understand the truth of Acts 17. That God is the God in heaven. And he raises up and brings down and he determines our length of age and our boundary of habitation and who's going to rule and who doesn't rule. And finally, Nebuchadnezzar came to himself. It took up 40 years for him to realize that he's nothing and the God of heaven is all.
And so he bowed his head, and he realized that the God of heaven was the one who ruled. You may see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. Well, my friends, as we start out in Daniel chapter 2, or excuse me, Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it starts out this way. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he was just uh, a late teenager, 18, 19 years old, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. A world empire attacking little old Jerusalem with a brand new leader, 18, 19 years old, barely dry behind the ears, and uh, they were besieging this. The Lord God Jehoiakim, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Those treasure, those Vessels will become something very important later on with the handwriting on the wall. Verse 3, Then king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and the nobles, youth in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding, discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's courts. Well, my friends, that was Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, among many others. Well, here's what happened. Nebuchadnezzar, sometimes he goes by other names, the king who was the father of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, was able to bring down Nineveh, the Assyrian power. And they traveled over to Carchemish to get away from Babylon and had uh, like another capital there. And so Nebuchadnezzar uh, was sanctioned to go and attack uh, the Carchemish area. Meanwhile, Nebonidas, the father of Nebuchadnezzar, was very ill. And up from Egypt comes Pharaoh Necho. He kills the king of Jerusalem, and uh, he they got into a little battle, and he lost his life. And then he goes on up to Carchemish, and there Nebuchadnezzar in 605 B.C. takes on the remainder of the Assyrian Empire and Pharaoh Necho and puts a wall up on. Pharaoh Necho barely escapes with his life. And he heads down back to Egypt. And meanwhile, uh, Nebuchadnezzar starts to go down the coast following him. And he has to deal with Jerusalem, which is a, kind of a semi-power. And he has to deal with them. So he besieges them for a little bit because they're going to be on his flank. And uh, they had been allies to or at least made to be allies to Egypt. And so he's besieging them. And uh, there was a re another reason why he wanted to uh, come there, and that was that 100 years earlier, there was a king named Hezekiah. And Hezekiah had a very serious disease. And he was going to die. <coughs> Matter of fact, Isaiah came in and told him he was going to die. And then as Isaiah was leaving and walking down the hall, <coughs> Hezekiah started to cry out to God, Oh God, I've been so faithful to you. I've helped rebuild the temple. I've made sure the doors are open. I've tried to get rid of these high places and false idols. And I have uh, stood for you. Oh, Lord, please help me. I don't want to die just yet. 
God says to Isaiah, turn around, go back to Hezekiah. See, Hezekiah, Isaiah hadn't gotten very far. And you tell him, I'm going to grant him more years of life. And so there was almost like a, it was a miraculous healing. And, and he was able to come out of that. How do I know that this is going to be true? And so there were, a uh, shadow went backwards. And it was just amazing. You know, God turned the clock backwards to show him. And uh, so... That was wonderful. And, and then there was this group of people from the Babylon area that uh, wanted to come and give him a gift and just praise the Lord for how he had this miraculous healing. And uh, we, we hear about this. Let me see. I should have this written down someplace. In 2 Kings 20. Let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 20. Chronicles Kings. 2 Kings chapter 20. Okay, verse 12. At that time, Barodach Baladan, a son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and presents, a present to Hezekiah. For he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Hezekiah listened to them and showed them all his treasure house, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious soil and the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasuries. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Look at what I got. And the Babylonians said, Hmm, that's very interesting. They knew there was a honey pot there, that they were wealthy. And so, a hundred years later, when Nebuchadnezzar was coming by, he knew there was a honey pot there. They had written this down, they'd passed this on down the line, and he was going to come calling. As a matter of fact, it says here in verse 14, Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say, and from where did they come They come to you? And Hezekiah said, They have come from a far country, from Babylon. He said, What have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, They have seen all that is in my house. And there is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Some of your sons who shall issue from you, whom you will beget, will be taken away, and they will become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he thought, Is it not so, if there will be peace and truth in my days? Okay, Hezekiah because of your braggadociousness and you're showing them everything you had, they know what you have and they're going to kind of be coming for it. And furthermore, some of your own progeny are going to be taken to Babylon, carried away and made to serve as officials. And I'm telling you, that was a hundred years before it actually happened. And it was written in the word of God. Now, how did God know that? It's because he's God. Because he knows what's going to happen in the future. He, he orchestrates things. And all of this stuff is coming down. So, meanwhile, here's Nebuchadnezzar besieging Jerusalem. He's making forays down to Egypt. And he gets word that daddy died. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has died. And he is the crown prince. He is the next in line. 
but it's going to take him two to three months to travel all the way back to Babylon. And by that time, when he gets there, there might be a new government. And when he gets there, they might put him to death. And so he comes back and he makes decent terms with, with uh, Jerusalem. And he says, I want this and this money and I want uh, royal hostages and uh, you pay me tribute, and well, I'll leave you in place. And so they got good terms, and then they took Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and many others, and they traveled that two to three month uh, journey on the Fertile Crescent around this desert called the Syrian Desert, or the Arabian Desert. Nobody travels across that. But Nebuchadnezzar was going to. He got these camels that could go for 30 days without drinking water. He supercharged them, fed them all the water that they could use, maybe took extra camels. He rode them to death. And maybe they gave out, then they got on the ones that were with them that weren't ridden, and he rode them to death. And he went across that Arabian desert 14 days or less, and got to Babylon when it would normally take two to three months. And he got in there before things got changed, and he got himself in power. So what are we looking at? We're looking at this guy named Hezekiah, who uh, gets healed by God, and then braggadociously shows everything to Babylon. Babylon defeats uh, Nineveh, they chase the Ninevites over now to Carchemish. Egypt has come up. He defeats them, and as he's going down toward Egypt, he has to cover his flank and besiege his Jerusalem. He continues on down there. Then he hears word that Dad has died. He makes his way back, makes favorable terms with Jerusalem, and then he takes hostages, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, and some gold and silver and things from the temple. Meanwhile, he goes in less than 14 days across the Arabian Desert. Nobody does that. They weren't expecting him, and he gets himself in place. And so here's the foibles of a braggadocious king. Uh, Nineveh falls. Nebuchadnezzar does this. He chases down Egypt and then besieges Jerusalem as, at the same time. Because his father dies, he makes favorable terms with Jerusalem. He travels across the Arabian Desert, and all these things are being done, and they don't have a fig of a notion that God is in charge. Even Hezekiah, he isn't acting very spiritual. And God raises up, and God brings down. Now, you see how God is using even these unspiritual people to accomplish his will you know something, friends? He can still do that. And he is doing that. And, uh, you know, we're coming into our political season. And I'm here to tell you, I don't, I don't worry a whole lot about it. God in heaven is ruling and reigning. And his ways are not our ways and his ways past finding out. He might take a righteous king of Israel and they only, only reign for 10 years and then you got this wicked, rotten crumb of a guy named Manasseh, and he reigns almost 50 years. And at the very end, he gets saved. And my, my friends, God has his ways of doing things. And in the meantime, we are to be involved with focusing upon God and living for him. So the stresses and strains and circumstances and tests that we go through in everyday life and politics, it all comes to a head and points us toward our righteous and mighty God who has created all the world from one man. He determines our boundaries, our habitation, our rising up and our going down, and we are to extol and praise the God of heaven realizing that there's going to come a day of judgment and we are going to be judged by the resurrected one, the Lord Jesus Christ, a man, a God man. Make your peace with him. I would rather go to the Bema judgment than the great white throne judgment.
And the beam of judgment is where we are judged for the righteous acts, not for salvation, but for rewards. And then uh, we will be given our righteous acts, our white robes and things like this, and we are the bride of Christ. And we will accompany him to the battle of Armageddon. And the millennium will be set up. And those who have opposed him will be put on the left side. And those that are with him will be put on the right side. And he will judge between the sheep and the goats. And then finally, there's a millennium, thousand year reign, world is repopulated. And then the battle of Gog and Magog and the eternal state is set up and the great white throne judgment happens. And all the dead are raised and they are judged by the righteous one out of the books. And if you are the righteous, your name, if it's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, will not be judged there, and you will have eternal life. Make your peace with the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive him, the supernatural stone cut out with hands, that is going to have the eternal kingdom. And get into that kingdom, my friends. And make sure that you're right with God.